court attention. All rise. Superior Court number 11 of the State of New York, the Honorable Judge William Heath presiding. People of New York versus Karen Andre. Ready, Your Honor. Ready, Your Honor. If Your Honor, please, I would like to report that I have issued a warrant for the arrest of Larry Regan, as he is obviously an accomplice in this murder. But he has disappeared. And as he was last seen with the defense counsel, I would Hold like to state that I believe. Keep your shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think I appeared for? Just to give you guys a thrill? I'll stay here. No need to issue any warrants. If she's guilty, I'm guilty. May proceed. Aaron Andre. <laughs> Ms. Andre, when you took the stand yesterday, did you know the whole truth about this case? No. And in view of certain circumstances that have arisen, do you wish to retract any of your testimony? No. When you first took the stand, did you intend to shield anyone? Your Faulkner. And do you still find it necessary to protect him? No. It's not necessary anymore. Do you still claim that Bjorn Faulkner committed suicide? No. Bjorn Faulkner did not commit suicide. He was murdered. I didn't kill him. Please believe me, not for my sake. Because you cannot let his murder go unpunished. I'll tell you the whole truth. I have lied at the inquest. I have lied to my own attorney. I'm going to lie here, but everything I've told you so far has been true. And I'll tell you the rest. Now, when court adjourned yesterday, you were about to tell us about Faulkner's way out of his difficulty. I said he was going to leave when how he pleased. I didn't mean he was to kill himself. I did push a man's body off the penthouse. That body had been dead before I even touched it. And it was not Bjorn Faulkner. Please explain this to us, Miss Andre. Bjorn wanted to be reported as dead but he didn't want any searches or investigations afterward. So he decided to stage a suicide, and then disappear. And I was to go with him. He had this plan in mind for a while, and he took 10 million from the Whitfield loan for the purpose. But we still needed someone to help us. Someone who could not be connected with him in any way. We only knew one person, Larry Regan. And why would Mr. Regan agree to help in so dangerous an undertaking? He loved me. And he helped you in spite of that? He helped me because of that. What was the plan, Miss Andre? Regan was to get a corpse. And on the evening of January 16th, Lefty O'Toole, a gunman, was shot by my whole gangsters. O'Toole's measurements, height, and hair were the same as Bjorn's. <clears throat> Regan stole his body, and he was the man I pushed off the penthouse. No, was that the extent of Mr. Regan's help? No. He was an air pilot. He was to get a plane and fly Bjorn to South America. That day, January 16th, Bjorn transferred the 10 millions to three different banks in Buenos Aires under the assumed name <coughs> Ragnar Hayden. I was to meet him a month later at the Hotel Continental in Buenos Aires and told him the three of us could not communicate. No matter what happened, we could not reveal the secret. Now tell us what happened on the night of January the 16th. Bjorn came to my house that night. And I'll never forget his smile when he stepped off the elevator. He loved danger. We had dinner together, and we drove to Regan's house. Regan had the corpse dressed in traveling clothes, in gray overcoat and hat. Then we drove back to my place, with the body. <clears throat> Bjorn wanted to be seen entering the apartment, so I didn't use my key. I rang the bell. Three of us were dressed formally to make it look like a party. We ordered Regan to support the body as if he were a drunken friend. The night janitor's wife let us in, and we went up in the elevator. And then what happened? Then we ordered exchanged clothes with the body, and wrote the letter and popped it up on the center table. Then the three of us had drinks, 
and Bruno Regan carried the body out and left it leaning against the parapet. Then, then we said goodbye. Bjorn was the first to go. He went down in the elevator. I stood there watching the needle of the indicator moving. It stopped. He was gone. And then? Then Regan left a few minutes later. They were to meet a few miles outside the city where Regan had left his plane. <clears throat> I was alone in the penthouse for an hour. It was silent. I didn't want to wait outside with the body, so I lay on the bed in my room. There was a clock on the nightstand that ticked in the darkness. I waited. After an hour had passed, I knew the plane had taken off and that Buen and Regan were on their way to South America. So I got up. I tore my dress to make it look like a struggle, and I went out to the garden. I looked down. The world seemed so far away. I took my gun, and I fired a shot into the air to explain the gun move in O'Toole's body, if it were to be discovered. I must have been nervous. I forgot all about the fingerprints. But I threw the gun on the ground, and I pushed the body over. I thought all of the orange troubles had gone with it. I didn't know his life would go too. That is all, Miss Andre. Miss Andre, you said you lied at the inquest. Yes. You said you lied to your return. Yes. And the story that you have told us here today entirely different from the one that you came into court prepared to tell. It is. Then why should we believe a word? How are we to know when you're lying and when you're telling the truth? Objection. Sustained. Now tell me, Miss Andre, didn't Mr. Faulkner have a clear conception of the difference between right and wrong. It was only whatever he wanted. You love Bjorn Paul? Yes. Such as he was? Because he was such as he was. Exactly, Miss Andre. Now what would you do if a woman were to take the man that you worshipped so insanely and change him from the ruthless brute you loved into her own ideal of an upright man, would you still love him? Objection. Sustained. But I want to answer. I want Mr. Flint to know that he is insulting your father's memory. You do. And yet you thought nothing of insulting him while he was alive by dividing your love with a gangster. Are you blouse? Go, Larry. You're mistaken, Mr. Flint. Regan loved me. I didn't love him. He didn't demand your love for his help? He demanded nothing. You didn't ask him to help you take revenge on your first lover? No. Why so particular, Miss Andre? Is there much difference between a swindler and a gangster? Objection! You said you were the only one who knew all of the details of Faulkner's swindling activities. Yes. You had enough information to put him in jail at any time. I'd never do that. But you could if you wanted to. I suppose so. Well, Miss Andre, isn't that the explanation for Faulkner's visits to you after his marriage? He wanted to reform, to avoid a crash. You held it over his head. You could bring him to ruin, all before he could make good for his crimes. Which one was it that held you, held him in your arms, Miss Andre? Was it love, or was it fear? He gave me the meaning of the word fear. Who knew about that transfer of $10 million to Buenos Aires? 
your and myself and Regan. Not just yourself and Regan alone, with your knowledge of Mr. Faulkner's business and your ability to forge his signature, could not you and Regan alone have transferred that money? That would have been necessary. Who would have given me the money had I asked for it? Your and Faulkner kept you an extravagant luxury. Yes. You hated to change your mood. See him turn his fortune over to investors to see him poor. No one was ever to see him poor. Of course not. Because you and your gangster lover were going to murder him and take the ten million that no one knew about. Sustained. You've heard it testified that Mr. Faulkner had no reason to commit suicide. His marriage to Miss Whitfield had given him the first happiness that he had ever known. And you hated him for that happiness, didn't you? You don't understand, Bjorn! Maybe I don't understand, Bjorn. But let me see if I understand you. You formed a partnership with a swindler on the first day that you met him. And with him, you defrauded thousands of investors the world over. You cultivated a friendship with a notorious gangster. You helped in a $25 million forgery. This you have told us plainly, flaunting your defiance of all sense of honesty. And you don't expect us to believe you capable of murder, Miss Andre? Wrong, Mr. Clint. I am capable of murder. For we are in Faulkner's sake. It's all this. Lawrence Regan. Lawrence Regan, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. <laughs> What is your name? Lawrence Regan. And what is your <laughs> occupation? <coughs> Unemployed. <laughs> now, how long have you known Miss Oscar? Five months. And where did you first meet her? Faulkner's office. I went there to do business with them. I gave up the business. I'm not a secretary. And how did you happen to become friendly with Miss Faulkner? With Miss Andre? Pardon. First meeting wasn't exactly friendly. She wouldn't let me in to see Mr. Faulkner. She said I had enough money to buy orchids by the pound. And had no business with the box. She said I'd think it over and went. I thought it over, only I didn't think of the business. I thought of her. The next day, I sent her a pound of orchids. <laughs> That's how it started. Now, did you know that Miss Andre loved Bjorn Faulkner? What up? I knew it was hopeless for me, but I couldn't help it. And you never expected Miss Andre to share your feelings? No. And you never tried to force your feelings upon her? You have to know all that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid we do. Kissed her once by force. It was the night of Faulkner's wedding. She was alone, so unhappy. I didn't want her to know that I. Uh, but she knew. She told me it was no use. We never mentioned it to me. Now, when did Miss Andre tell you of Mr. Faulkner's plans to escape to South America? About two weeks before we pulled it. And was Lefty O'Toole one of your men? No. Did you have any connection with his murder? No, I'm sorry. So you had no definite you had no definite knowledge of his planned murder? No. I just had a way of guessing. What happened on the night of January the 16th? It happened as Miss Andre has told me. But she only knows half the story. I know the rest. Well, tell us what happened after you left the penthouse back then. I left ten minutes after Fox. He had taken my car to cover his identity. 
uh, he was to meet me in Metal Lane. I left another one of my, I had one of my men, excuse me, leave another cop at the door. I stepped on it full speed. Where did you go? Through Metal Lane. Ten miles out, Kings County. <coughs> Faulkner was to get that first and wait for me. I left my plane there early in the evening. We were to leave at once for one service. What time did you arrive? About midnight. There was a bright moon, I remember. I turned off the road, and I could see tire tracks in the mud where Faulkner's car had passed. I drove out into the lane, and then I thought I'd lose my mind. The plane was gone. What did you do? I searched for that plane for two hours. Faulkner's car was there, where we had agreed to hide it. It was empty, lights turned off, keys in the switch. I saw tracks on the ground where the plane had taken off. But Faulkner wasn't a pilot. He couldn't fly the plane himself. Were there any clues to this mystery? Yes, one. A car I found hidden in the brush. What kind of car? Uh, big black sedan. And then what did you do? I wanted to know whose car it was, so I settled down in the back seat to wait. And how long did you have to wait? The rest of that night. And then? Then the only one came back. I saw him coming. He had no hat, face looked weird, his clothes were re-pulled and re-spotted. What did you do? I pretended I was asleep in the back seat. I watched him. He approached the car, opened the door, and he saw me. His face gave a start as if he'd been struck. Well, then what did you do? Uh, I awakened, <coughs> stretched, rubbed my eyes, and said, oh, it's you. He said, who are you? I said, my name's Larry Regan. You may have heard it. I was in a bit of trouble and had to hide out for a while and finding this car here was quite a convenience. He said, I'm sorry, but you'll have to get out. I'm in a hurry. Did you get out? No. I stretched again. I said, what's the hurry? He said, none of your business. I smiled and said I would like to have the whole story. And what did he say to that? First he said nothing. He took out a checkbook and looked at me. I shrugged, looked at him. Then he said, wouldn't five thousand dollars be enough? I said it'll do. Lawrence Regan's the name. He wrote out the check. I have it here. We offer this check in evidence. What is all this nonsense? Who was the man? Who was the man, Mr. Regan? I'll let the clerk read that check to you. Would you kindly read the check? Paid to the order of Lawrence Regan the sum of $5,000. Signed, John Graham Whitfield. This is an outrage! I demand to see that check! We offer this check in evidence. Objection! Objection overruled. Submitted in evidence. <coughs> after Mr. Whitfield had given you that check? I threw my gun, stuck it in his ribs, and said, now you lousy cut, what did you do with Fox? How can this man be made? How can he be allowed to make such statements? Order. The witness is allowed to testify. If what he says is found to be perjury, he will suffer the consequences. <laughs> See, Mr. What did he answer to that, Mr. Regan? Let's see, Mudder. I don't know what you're talking about. But I jammed the gun harder and said, I have no time to waste. Where did you take him? Did you get any information out of him? Not a word. I talked and threatened. It was no use. I let him go. I knew I could always get him. I didn't want to kill him. Yeah. Uh, and then you tried to find Paul. I didn't lose a second. I rushed home, jumped into some flying clothes, <clears throat> grabbed another plane, and flew to Buenos Aires. I searched, advertised in the papers, and got no answer. No one called at the banks for the 10 millions transferred under the name Ragnar Hayden. Well, then did you try and communicate with Sandra? Well, we, no. I mean, 
she was arrested for Faulkner's murder. We promised not to see each other for a month. I laughed when I read that, but I couldn't say a word. Not to betray Faulkner if he was still alive. What did you do? I waited. And what were you waiting for? For the month to pass. February the 16th. I went to the Hotel Continental in Buenos Aires, and I set my teeth. And I waited every minute of every hour of that last day. He never came. And then? Then I knew he was dead. I came back to New York, started a search for my plane. We found it yesterday. And how were you able to identify it? Well, I was able to identify the plane by the engine number. It had been landed and fire set to it in a deserted valley in New Jersey, 20 miles from Meadow Lane. And was the plane empty? No, I found the body of a man in it. Could you identify him? No one could. It was nothing but a burned skeleton. I examined the body, or what was left of it. The height was the same. It was Faulkner. I found two bullet wounds in the bone. One through the right hand, the other over the heart. He must have been disarmed first, shot through the hand, then murdered, then straight through the heart. That is all, Mr. Regan. Just what is your business, Mr. Regan? I have refused that information to others. It would seem so partial if I only told you. What do you do when a prospective client refuses to pay you protection? I'm legally allowed not to understand what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> then I will try to make it clear. May I question you as to whether you read the newspapers? You may. Well, question me. <laughs> Kindly state whether you read the newspapers. Occasionally. Then perhaps you read that when Mr. James Sutton Vance Jr. refused to pay protection to a certain gangster, his magnificent country home in Westchester was destroyed in an explosion just after the guests left, barely missing a wholesale slaughter. What was that, a coincidence? A remarkable coincidence, Mr. Hood. Just after the guests left. <laughs> Perhaps you read that when Mr. Van Dorn refused oh, we to object. pay- we object, these questions are irrelevant. Sustained. <coughs> So you had no ill feeling towards Mr. Faulkner for the failure of your business with him? No. Now, Mr. Lawrence Regan, what would you do if someone were to take from you the woman that you love so much and then cast her aside simply because he found someone else with more money? I'd cut his throat with a dull saw. <laughs> Would. I would. And yet you expect us to believe that you, Larry Regan, gangster, outlaw, scum of the underworld, would step aside with a grand gesture and throw this same woman back into the arms of that same man? Or we object. Sustained. I love. Then why did you allow Faulkner to visit her after his marriage? Just a rare privilege. You two didn't hold a blackmail plot over his head? Found any proof of that? Her association with you is the best proof. Objection. Sustained. How did you kill Faulkner in the penthouse that night? Objection. Sustained, Mr. Flint. 
you deny any part in Faulkner's murder. I do. And you deny being an accomplice to that murder. I do. And yet you admit knowledge of the fantastic plot which Miss Andre has just described. I do. <laughs> to what extent did you participate? Mr. Flint, I merely provided the corpse. And nothing else? Nothing else. Exhibit B. Mr. Regan, do you recognize this gun? No. Then allow me to refresh your memory. This is the gun. It was found in the penthouse on the night of January the 16th. The gun Miss Andre claims she fired in the air. The gun she claims was hers. Now, do you recognize the gun? No. <laughs> I have here an affidavit which states that a certain 32 caliber pistol, a serial number CC3490 was sold by a store in New Jersey to a certain Lawrence Reagan. Mr. Flynn, if you'd please, I'd like to see that. Of course, Mr. Smith. There is no CC3490 on this gun, Mr. District Attorney. No? Did you ever hear of the heat test? No. It's true. The number on this gun has been filed off. But when heated red hot, it still discloses the serial number CC3490. This is satisfactory, Mr. Flynn. Submitted as evidence. Accepted as Exhibit F. You admit that you were in the penthouse with Miss Andre and Mr. Faulkner on the night of January the 16th. Then perhaps, Mr. Regan, you can tell us, where is your other accomplice? The man who played the drunk? Lefty O'Toole. I can give you his exact address. Evergreen Cemetery, Whitfield Family Memorial, which is the swankiest place all Lefty's ever been. Look at this straight. You claim that the body buried in Evergreen Cemetery that of Lefty O'Toole. Yes. And the same corpse that was thrown from the Faulkner building. And the man that you found in the burned plane is Bjorn Faulkner. Yes. What's to prove it isn't the other way around? Supposing you did steal O'Toole's body. What's to prove you didn't stage this whole fantastic thing yourself? That you didn't plant both the plane and the body in New Jersey and then come here with this wild story in a desperate attempt to save Miss Andre. You've heard her testify that you would do anything. That you would lie for her. That you would murder for her. Objection. Sustained. Where is your real proof, Mr. Regan? Mr. Flint, you're a district attorney. And I you know what I am. We both have a lot of dirty work to do. And such is life, for most of it. Do you think we're both so well that if something passes us to which one kneels, we no longer have eyes to see it? I love her. She loved Faulkner. That's our only proof. <coughs> That's all, Mr. <sighs> 